How I love Jesus because he first loved me. It tells of one whose loving heart can fill my deepest woe. Who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. It is now time for the Lamb's Offering and the children's story. The Lamb's Offering goes to support our uh, church school right across the road. And if the young people would like to come up, we have them carry some butterfly nets around. You'll have to wear a mask when you uh, walk down the, the aisles if you want to participate in this today. But we'd love for our young ones to come forward if they would do so at this time. Good morning. It's good to see a happy Sabbath. Now, we sang a song just before children's story. Do you remember what we sang? What the chorus was? Oh, how I. And why do you love Jesus? Because he first loved you. Do you know the Heavenly Father loves you too? He does love you. Do your parents love you? They do love you. Now, there's someone else that loves you today that we don't talk about very much. But I know the Bible says that uh, there was someone assigned to watch out for you the day you were born. And they love you very much. And they love to watch out for you and protect you. Your mom, yeah. <laughs> your mom does watch out for you and protect you. It's someone who's with you even when your mom's not there. It's some, your dad. It's someone who's with you even when your dad's not there. So when you're, you're out and about, maybe you're riding your bike down the street. Jesus, Jesus he is with you. But there's somebody else. He's a son. What's that? Your grandpa and grandma? Yeah, they're there too. What's that? An angel. That's right. You have an angel that loves you. And angels love to watch out for us, protect us. They love to serve us. They love to be around us when we're praying. They love to be around us when we're singing about Jesus because angels love to sing about Jesus. They love to work for Jesus. I had a friend in school that shared this week a story about when his mom met an angel. I love angel stories. And I love to hear stories about when people actually meet an angel or maybe their angel. My friend, when he was younger, his dad was a pastor, so his mom and dad worked for the church. 
he didn't really like the church very much because he felt like he didn't get to see his dad very much because he was always over at the church. Well, one Sunday afternoon, an organist was over at the church practicing some organ music, and she called my friend's mom and says, there is a homeless man inside our church. I forgot to lock the door. Now they're inside the church. I need you to come over right away. And so my friend's mom drove over to the church to see this homeless man who was sitting waiting patiently for her. And when she got there, there he was. She said, hello, my name is Wanda. I'm the pastor's wife. How can I help you today? What are you doing here in Na I, it was Idaho? I think it's Napa or Nampa, Idaho is where they're from. She's like, what brings you here to our church today? Now, they weren't open that day because it's a Seventh-day Adventist church, but the organist was just here practicing the organ. And she said, well, what brings you here to our church today? And he said, well, I am here because I'm just fi finishing up a, a mission that I've been given. He said, I've been here in your, in your area for a while helping parents find a lost child for them. And I just finished that mission. She said, oh. He said, really, I, I stopped by just to see if I could get some food. And she said, I'd be glad to take you for some food. There's a little pizza place just down the road if you'd like to go with me. He said, I'd love to do that. And so he picked up all that he had, which was a backpack. And in that backpack, she didn't know what was inside of it, but she knew it was sticking out of it. It was a Bible. And she could see the Bible was well read. She said, hmm, so you're a Bible reader. He said, yes, I love the Bible. I love God's word. So he got in the car, and they went to get pizza. And she was just thinking, well, hmm, there's only one thing, because she knew a lot of people like to get pepperoni pizza, and she didn't like to get people pepperoni pizza. She's like, well, I'll, I'll let you get any pizza you want, but I'm kind of against, you know, getting pepperoni, because I don't think it's the healthiest. But he's like, that's fine. I just like cheese pizza. You can get me one of those. And uh, she asked him what his name was, and he said, my name is Adam Singer. That's really all she got to know about Adam Singer. And he was traveling by himself, and she said that he had a he had a dark, uh, black, well-trimmed beard, bright blue eyes, and that uh, she just kept looking at his Bible that was coming from his backpack. And they went there, and he smiled at her when he got his pizza. And then he said this to her. He quoted a Bible verse. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Whatever you've done to the least of these, you've done unto me. When we help other people, we're actually helping Jesus. And Hebrews chapter 13 says, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, because in doing so, some people have actually entertained angels unaware. And uh, she paused again. She was turning around and uh, says, uh, and said, Who are you? And he responded, Wanda. So he told her what her name was. He said, Wanda. She asked him more about himself. But he said, Wanda. And then he gives her middle and last name. He won't give his mom's middle and last name. He, wants to keep, but he said, Wanda, middle and last name. I have known you since April 4, 1950 blank, which was her birth date. And he said, at this time, he said, he never saw my mom's driver's license. There was no internet that you could use to find out this information. And uh, he told her that he was on his way to Chicago to do another mission uh, that he was been assigned to. And uh, she didn't ask him a lot more about himself says, most people, including my mother, might immediately take the opportunity to ask more questions and engage in a deeper conversation. But at that moment, she felt a complete peace come over her, and it seemed in her mind that the most normal thing to do was pay for his meal, wish him well, and then leave, which she did. A few pleasant trees were exchanged, and she wished him well on his remaining travels. And then he goes on, this friend of mine, he says, I've seen a lot of paintings in life about angels. And there's a painter named Harry Anderson, and sometimes he'll paint little children who are playing on a bridge, and the little girl's about to fall in the water, and you find an angel, you know, protecting her and watching out. But he said, sometimes angels might just show up uh, just like common people. And they might uh, um, show up in ways that you might least expect them. But he said his mom believes to that day that she met either her guardian angel or at least an angel that knew about her because no one else could have given him all that information. But he was there on a mission in Idaho to help some parents find their lost kids. And I thought, you know what? I've been lost before. I wonder if my angel showed up, maybe in the form of a security guard. Because I told this story one time when I was lost at a fair. I don't know who that security guard was, but they took me to lost and found so I could get found. What if that person, I'll get to heaven and say, wow, that was an angel that knew I was lost, showed up to the security guard, took me to to the lost and found and then walked away and I'll get to heaven like I was at security guard. We don't know the places where angels get involved in our lives and look out for us. But today, I just want you to know that God loves you and that he has given us angels to look out for us and they love us too. 
And uh, let's thank God today. Uh, it doesn't have to be right this second, but remember to thank God. Say, God, thank you for giving me an angel to watch out for me and who loves and cares for me and who loves you. And remember this, wherever we are found worshiping Jesus, angels love to be there too because they love to worship God and they love to work for God. And I pray that we'll, we'll be that way as well. Thanks for being good listeners. You can go back to your seats. if the deacons can come forward. Today's offering goes to the local church budget, and uh, I know we're living in some tough times uh, economically, and uh, there's a lot struggling maybe right now financially, looking for a job. Um, maybe some of you are waiting for the next stimulus payment or um, you know some sort of assistance, and I know that you can bring those petitions to the Lord. I just want to read a promise to you guys, though, in Malachi chapter 3. You guys know the verse. It's found in verse 8. It says, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, In what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with the curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. This is a promise. He says, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that, will, that there will not be room enough to receive it. What a promise. And for those that are struggling during this time, uh, give what you can. Uh, the Lord knows. But I know that this promise holds true, that he will, I've experienced it myself, he will pour out the windows and uh, pour out his blessings down toward you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for um, this beautiful sunshine you've given us. Lord, it's been a cold week, but Lord, we're, we're, we feel great warmth being here with our brothers and sisters today, having this uh, church that we can worship together and sing praises to you. And Lord, at this time, I just pray that you may um, bless this, uh, these offerings and tithes that we, we give to you, that you will put in your storehouse. I pray, Lord, that you may multiply it that this money may be used, Lord, um, to be a blessing, Lord, to help those that need it, to help the church, Lord, to continue to operate so that we can be a light in this community. Um, be with those that are financially st suffering as well right now. Please continue to, uh, to challenge them, Lord, to, um, to uphold these, uh, to test these truths and these promises, Lord, that if they are faithful, Lord, you'll be even more faithful to them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Heavenly Father, again, thank you, Lord, for this house of worship.
We're thankful, Lord, that uh, we have this freedom. We still have this freedom, Lord, to worship you and to study your word. And Lord, you know all the things going on um, in this world, and we know that you're coming back soon. Just want to pray for each person in this room that they may um, yield to the Holy Spirit. Lord, we know the Holy Spirit's working in our hearts to get us ready, Lord. Um, Lord, we want to be faithful to you. We want to have you in our hearts. We want to live. We want to. T- uh, we want to talk like you. We want to act like you, Lord. But we can't do that in our own power. We need the Holy Spirit. And I just pray for the Holy Spirit this time to come down and um, come into the hearts and minds of each of us here. I pray, Lord, for Pastor Rob, that you may speak through him. May his words not be his own. But, Lord, may you anoint his lips that when he speaks, that the Holy Spirit, the words, can, can penetrate our hearts. That can convict us, Lord, to want to draw even closer to you. And, Lord, if there was a time to draw close to you, Lord, it's now. I pray, Lord, for, uh, again, those that are going through so many different troubles. There's people in Texas, Lord, and we know they've been without power. uh, Something, Lord, that has really caused so much trouble, Lord, and suffering down there. And I pray, Lord, that you may be with all those people. You hear their cries. uh, You hear their, their struggles. Please be with all those people in Texas and families and friends down there that you may be able to get them the electricity, the power that they need, but most importantly, Lord, power through the Holy Spirit during the time. And I also want to pray, Lord, for those that are sick, that are suffering. Lord, we had heard word, and um, we've, we've, we've heard about the family, Lord, that was involved in an accident. Lord, I know that I had just heard that uh, one, of the, uh, one of the babies, Lord, out of the three is potentially paralyzed right now from this car accident that happened on Thursday, and is in Vanderbilt and be with the doctors right now, Lord, as uh, they're working to save the lives of these kids and, and rehab them, Lord, so that they can get back to their to their normal lives and be with all those uh, involved in that accident, all the families. Uh, please continue to watch. And again, Lord, just um, help us to draw closer to you at this time. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Matthew chapter 22, verse 35 to 40. And it reads, Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him, and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. It's a blessing to be here today find encouragement uh, gathered together. I was sharing at prayer meeting that one of the reasons or main reason why we should come together at prayer meetings or even at church, it says do not forsake the assembling together as some do so that we can encourage one another as the day of the Lord approaches. That's why we come really to find encouragement, to be an encouragement uh, because I tell you what, there are a lot of days we just need encouragement and uh, we definitely find that in God's word. He says, be strong and of good courage. Alpha of apostasy, where he was sharing in his book called The Living Temple, uh, pretty much how healing doesn't necessarily come from God, but from forces of nature, or even yourself, because God is omnipresent, which means he's in everything, and if God is in the trees, when I walk underneath the trees, there's healing that's taking place as I walk in the woods. The woods are healing me. Or when I breathe in the air, since God is, in essence, the air, I'm actually healing myself because the air has become God. It's kind of like mind over matter. Your mind is healing itself because God is in your mind. And as you think thoughts of healing, you're healing yourself. That was the... and who does what? Heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from destruction. 
Because our health message is not just to help people get well physically, it's to help them get well spiritually. Because what does it profit a man if he gets well and lives his life here and gains the world but loses his own soul? That was the point of the health message, so we could bring them to the three angels' messages so they could receive eternal life. Not just, okay, they got better, now you can, where do you want to go? I want to go to Disney World now that I'm well. They're showing the shirts that they were selling on the hospital. Avoid the light was one of the shirts. Black t-shirt that had the body of an angel and, and wings on the back. And it said, avoid the light. because your word is truth and your word is life. And Lord, we want to, we want to be uh, followers of truth. We want to be... ...article this week from Market Watch. And uh, it was entitled, why, why Do Americans Get Married? You'd be surprised that most Americans today do not get married because of love. Maybe that's why that there's more divorces today uh, than marriages that last. But most Americans do not marry because of love. It says close to 60% of Americans in the survey said they do not marry because of love. So why would they get married? Well, the number one reason is Financial, you're right. Most Americans get married for money. They get married for financial security. Following that, Americans get married because of some of them said we had health conditions, and it still goes to financial security. We had health conditions, so we married our partner for their insurance. Like, well, that's really nice. Can I marry you so that I can get all my health, health needs met through your insurance since I have none? Some of them said that we got married because we liked a uh, the retirement investments, and we want to make sure that, again, goes back to money, the love of money. Um, some of them got married because of political aspirations. They knew that their spouse could help them get politically or get the job they wanted to get, socioeconomic status. Some of them said, well, we just got married because we thought they looked nice. Well, those looks quickly fade, so I don't know how long that one, that one lasted. But very few got married, well, less than half got married because of love. As I read this article, I was thinking, I, I wonder how many Christians follow Jesus out of love? How many people go to church out of love? Or is it because of some other reason? And, uh, even though I couldn't find statistics exactly on um, why do people, uh, or yeah, why, why do Christians, are We choose our church because my church loves God and they love each other. I thought that's interesting. Not one person says, I go to church because I love the Lord. Or I chose my church because they love the Lord and because they love one another. The first reason why people said we choose to go to church is the quality of sermon. They said, well, if it's a message I want to hear, then I want to go. And that's why you have these mega churches so full of people today because they get to hear messages that their itching ears want to hear. And uh, some of the biggest churches, you know, they're, they're going to uh, hear motivational speakers. And that's why they choose to go there. Second reason is they go to churches because they feel welcomed. Third, the style of service and worship. So they like the music of the church. They like 
You have coffee and donuts before going into church. They, like, they can wear their pajamas and slippers to church, or they can wear shorts and t-shirts to church. That's why they choose that church. That was 74% of people said so they chose the church because of that. Isn't that interesting? Um, that was followed by location. We, we choose this church because it's in a popular location. It's where everybody goes. Education, kids, and children programs. Number six, family and friends. Education. And uh, number seven was available, the different opportunities they got by going to that church. But not one person said, we choose this church to be part of this church family because they love Jesus and because they love each other. Today we sang a song, Oh How I Love Jesus. I learned that song at summer camp. But I sang it just because it was a kid's song and I learned it. I asked today, when you sing it, why do you sing it? What does it mean to you to love Jesus? And if, you, if someone asked you today, why do you go to the church you go to, when you put down, I go to that church because they love Jesus and because we love one another. If they asked you, you might have said, well, because they have the truth. Well, you can have the truth. That doesn't mean you love Jesus. The Jews had the truth. The Pharisees had the truth, but they didn't love Jesus. What we say today, we go to the Adventist, Jasper Adventist Church because we love Jesus. We say today, we are Christians. We unite together because we love Jesus. Jesus. That brings me today to our scripture that was read. I think a lot of people today hopefully wouldn't say, well, we go to this church because, or we follow Jesus because we, we want financial security. It was kind of read in scripture. Do you give your offerings to God because you want blessings to fall out on you, or do you give your offerings to God because you love Jesus? But what if you don't get the blessings you thought you were going to get when you keep giving because you love Jesus? Do we do things for others because we're hoping to get something back? Or do we do it because we love Jesus? He said, you know what, Lord, we're going to church because we want your blessings, we want your health, we want your happiness, we want, your, uh, we want an emotional euphoric high. We're coming to church because we have a fear of burning. Why do we love Jesus? Why do we come to church? Matthew chapter 22 is a scripture we read today. Matthew 22, starting in verse 34. Now, when you look at uh, the story in context, you have the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. They're all coming to spend time with Jesus, not because they love him. They're coming to spend time with Jesus so that they can trip up Jesus and get him to say something that they can persecute him for, to arrest him for, to end his ministry. That's why they're spending time with Jesus. They know his word, and they use his word to entrap Jesus. But it's interesting because every time they do, Jesus has an answer that silences them. There's no, no critic of Jesus that uh, knows the word or knows how to interpret the word as good as Jesus. And uh, so the Pharisees came, and they failed. The Sadducees came, and they failed. Now the Pharisees are back again. And here we find in uh, Matthew 22, verse 34, it says, but when the Pharisees heard that, that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. So they're going to get their best guy this time. It says, then one of them was a lawyer, lawyer, and asked Jesus a question, testing him and saying, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Now, I wonder if Jesus would actually just pick one commandment that would have had him. Look, you said this was the greatest one, but it's not. You're putting this above this. But Jesus was already ready for it, and Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. As I read this story this week, I realized that the church is divided into two camps, two groups. And you're either one or the other, or you're leaving one group or the other. But the church is divided amongst people who are lawyers and people who are lovers. Originally, I was going to call it liars and lovers, but I thought liar was kind of a harsh word. But a lot of lawyers are liars. I, I've sat in a lot of court hearings, and I've been asked a couple times to not tell the truth, just so that we could win. Lawyers are focused on the law. And there are a lot of people in church today that are focused on God's law. 
even in the Adventist church. Yeah, we're, we're Adventists because we keep the commandments of God. We are law keepers. Lawyers do one of two things, usually. Lawyers either are defenders or they are prosecutors. So they're either accusers of the brethren and condemners, like we find in the story where the woman was brought to Jesus, you know, she was caught in the act of adultery, and they said, Jesus, this woman needs to be killed. She broke the law. So you have the, the accusing attorneys in the church, and then you have the defending attorneys in the church. And they're the ones who are trying to justify why they do what they do. Well, I did this because of this. And I'm allowed to do this because of this. And I can not keep the law because of this, this, and this. It's kind of like the conservatives and the liberals. Conservatives are usually the accusers, and the liberals are usually the defendants. And they're always trying to either accuse one another or, or give reasons why they can do whatever they want. But they're all focused on law. And then Jesus says, look, you're getting me to focus on the law, but you're missing the whole point. Because the law is all based on love. Are you a lawyer or are you a lover? Now, I had to be honest with myself, and I thought for a little bit, I'm probably still coming out of the lawyer phase, unfortunately. As a kid, I actually got the nickname from my dad. He said, you are a jailhouse lawyer. He said, you'd be somebody defending somebody who's totally guilty and supposed to go to jail, but you defend them to the hilt. Because every time I was about to get punished, and I did something wrong, I'd defend myself. And I think of all the reasons why I did this. He said, Dad, I did this, but it was because of this, this, and this, and this. So you really can't punish me, because it's really my brother's fault. Isn't that what Adam said to, to Jesus when he comes? He's like, yeah, Lord, I ate the fruit, but it's the woman's fault, and you made her, so really it's your fault. So the lawyers are always defending and trying to justify themselves. And we know what Galatians says, that no man can justify themselves. So am I a lawyer? Am I a legalist? Jesus goes on, I'm not going to read Matthew 23, but read it, and he actually kind of defines their worship. He said, you guys come to church each week, but let me, who I love, I'm going to rebuke. And Matthew 23 is a rebuke of the whole entire church system. And he tells people, he's like, look, do what the pastors teach, but don't do what they do. And as I thought about how the church was in Jesus' time, it reminds me of Congress today. What, what is Congress? They are law makers. And they're law breakers. Because most of the laws they make, they don't keep. I thought a lot of just the time of COVID and how many mayors and governors made all these laws, but they don't keep them themselves. And they don't really, I guess they make laws, and we're going to get to this now, the three, three ways to know that, that we're lovers and not lawyers. And I'll explain some of that as we get to that. So let's go ahead to that. Today, the rest of the message is three, three ways, three examples to know if you're a lover or if you're a lawyer. Uh, I praise God that he's sanctifying all of us. Some of us might be way over here on the loving side. Some of us might be way on the law side. Some of us might be coming out of the law side. Some of us might be heading back to the law side. But God wants us to be lovers because God is love. There's nowhere in the Bible which says God is law. I can't find that verse. It doesn't say God is law. It doesn't say God is a lawyer. But it does say God is love, and he's called us to love. So here's three, three um, examples the Bible gives of what it means to be a lover. John 14, 15. If you have your Bibles, go through these three uh, examples uh, with you this morning. John 14, verse 15. And here Jesus says to his disciples, If you love me, keep my commandments. I say, Pastor, that's unfair. You just said that we're not supposed to be lawyers, and now you're focusing on the law. Yep, I am. Because being a lover doesn't mean the law is thrown out. Being a lover means you embrace the law, really. And we're going to talk about that today. John 14, 15, Jesus says, If you love me, if you want to be a lover like I am, keep my commandments. When Jesus talks about the two great commandments, he wasn't throwing the commandments out. He was just telling them, hey, the commandments are all about love, and you've missed the whole point of the commandments. 1 John, 1 John, 1 John 5, and verses 1 to 3, John writes this, Whoever believes that Jesus is Christ is born of God. Everyone who loves Jesus 
or everyone who loves him, which be God, who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. So everyone who loves the Father loves Jesus. Everyone who loves Jesus loves the Father. Verse 2, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome or grievous. So it's not just about keeping the law. It's keeping the law with the motive of love. They're not a burden. You can read Psalm 119. It's a great psalm where David over and over again says, I love thy law. It's my meditation. People who really love God will love his law. And people who really love his law will love him. And the commandments won't be a burden. And they won't make it a burden on others because they realize that the law of God set them free. And the law is really just a transcript of his character. They don't keep it out of obligation. They don't keep it out of fear from punishment. They don't keep it to gain salvation. They keep the law of God because they love Jesus. And Jesus says, if you really love me, you're going to keep it. We had a uh, car crash at my house just before I left. If you've been to my house, some of you have, you know that there's a big steep bank going up to my house, and there's a, uh, um, a big cement driveway and that little conduit that goes through there to let the water flow through. And a car came left of center on a Thursday morning before I went to Ohio, and they smashed into the side of our driveway. So our driveway, if you can see, there's a bank down here, and it goes up like this, and it's about three feet high, and someone smashed their little Honda Civic at 45 miles an hour into our cement driveway, flipped around, their airbag came out, and they lived. I went and saw the cops, and they were going to have to go to the hospital. But how could someone do that? How could someone be driving 45 miles an hour, come left of center, and smash into our driveway and total their car? Seems kind of weird. How do you total your car and run into somebody's driveway? But that's what they did. They ran into my driveway and totaled their car and had to go to the hospital. Now, there's a law in Tennessee that's called hands-free, which means you're not to text and drive, which means you're not to be talking and driving. Now, I'm going to guess that many of us in this room break that law from time to time. Maybe some of you a lot more than others. And I see a lot of people swerving left of center quite a bit, to be honest, and I see their phones in their hand. And it makes me really upset, thinking, why are you doing that? They made the law because they wanted to protect life. A lot of people see that law as a nuisance, especially younger people. They say, man, this stinks. You're trying to take away my freedom. I should have the freedom to be able to text and drive if I want to. And I should have the freedom to be able to talk on my phone if I want to and hold up my hands if I want to. I praise God that person hit my driveway and crashed because there was a line of 10 cars. I thought, what if he would have hit another car head on and killed himself and killed that person because he was texting and driving? Now, there are some people who, as soon as they don't see a cop around, they start texting and driving and they go down these country roads. Well, no one's here. That's right. There were no cops there that day. My driveway was there and you smashed into it. But there are no cops there, so you're following the law not out of love or concern by these other people who are about to come, and now we're stopped there and couldn't get to work for about a half an hour before they got you out of the way. But there are a lot of people who keep rules just because they don't want to get caught. And as long as I don't get caught, or if there's someone there that's going to police me, then I'll keep the rule. But as soon as that person's gone, I'm going to keep it. Do you keep the rules because you love other people who are driving in the road and say, you know what? I don't want to kill someone when I drive home today. So I'm not going to text and drive. Or you say, I'm not going to text and drive because pastor made me feel guilty. Because then you're still keeping the law, but out of guilt. Or I'm not going to text and drive because I'm really afraid that I can't do two things at once. Why do we keep God's laws? What is our motive? What's our motive by keeping the law of the land? Jesus says, I want your motive. If you love me, keep my laws. If you don't love them, what's the purpose? You think you're going to get to heaven by keeping a bunch of rules and not loving Jesus? That's what the Pharisees thought. They're all trying to trap him and trying to end his ministry and end his life. But they're still all going to heaven because they're good law keepers. But not really. Because Jesus says, my law is based on love. 
And if you're really keeping the law, you will love me. So I'm not throwing out the law today because lovers that keep the law aren't lovers. They keep the law because they know the law is based on love, and in keeping it, they're caring for their fellow men. And they're expressing their love to God. There's going to be a law that is passed here in the not too far future, I believe. A law of worship. The laws are still in the books. You can find the Sunday Blue Laws. They're still there. They haven't been taken away. In fact, I have a video I put on YouTube. It's a music video about dealing with these new laws that will be coming out soon in our neighborhood, quite possibly. I thought, yeah, there's going to be some Sunday worship laws that are brought out that will supposedly make society better. And I began to think about this week, and I said, you know, it's interesting when you talk to someone who keeps Sunday sacred. I've gotten these answers. We keep that day because of tradition. It is tradition. We keep that day to protect the environment. It's a big push right now. We want to protect our environment. We want to love the environment. Okay. We keep that day to honor the resurrection. Okay. We keep that day because we want to have family time. We keep that day because we just want a day off. I've heard lots and lots of reasons why you can keep that day, but there's one reason you will never hear. So when this law is brought to our country and to the forefront, they can never say we keep that day because we love Jesus. Because Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And the Sunday law will not be one of his commandments. Or Sunday sacredness. So you can keep Sunday for a lot of reasons. And a lot of reasons which make, might make sense to you. But you can never say, I keep it because I love God. Because God says, if you love me, you'll keep my day. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And worship me who created you. When I come to church on the Sabbath, am I coming because I love Jesus? You can even come to church out of obligation and not have a loving walk with Jesus on that day. In fact, that's how I found a lot of my family who was Sunday keepers. They went to church, and when that church was done, they're like, yes, we are free. Let's go, Let's go home and watch the ball games. But unfortunately, I know Sabbath keepers the same way. Church is done. Yes, we're free. What can we do for ourselves? Number one example to know if you're a lawyer or a lover. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Number two, um, verse, we will look at uh, 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. 1 John 4. And... Uh, Challenge you to read the whole chapter, but due to time constraints, we're going to get to the end of the chapter now. First John 4 and verse 20. And here John writes this. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does uh, not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. I've been part of churches where people in the same church didn't love one another. They might not use the word hate. There's a lot of hostility, and they may, might as well use the word hate. I've been in churches where people did not love fellow members. I'm talking to people who didn't love people in their own family. Husbands who didn't love their wives. Wives who didn't love their husbands. Kids who didn't love their parents. But they loved God. They loved one another, supposedly. But God says, how can you love me when you've never seen me and you can't love somebody that you see and spend time with? Take it to Matthew chapter 5. You might say, well, I do. I do love my family. I love my kids. I'm pretty good at church. But in Matthew 5, Jesus takes it even a step further. In Matthew 5 verse 43, he says, you've heard that it is said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Jesus says, I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. It's hard to love somebody who's cursing you. It's hard to love somebody who's making your life miserable. But Jesus says, if you love me, you'll love them too. Why? Jesus says, do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who persecute you, that they may or that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? 
Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you have more than the others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Jesus asked us to love people who are enemies because he loves his enemies. Jesus asked us to love those who persecuted us because he loved those who persecuted him. Jesus loved those who were nailing him on the cross. Jesus loves lost people. And Jesus says, how can you love me who you can't see or God who you haven't seen and not love people? Now this month is Black History Month. And the sad reality is there is still racism in the church today. I'll be honest. There's racism in the church today. I grew up, my grandpa was a head elder in a church, and I heard him make statements that were racist. They were. And I was 12 years old and heard him make some statements one time, and I felt very uncomfortable, and I didn't know how to respect my grandpa and say anything, so I kept silent. But I thank God that he's a sanctifying God, and some people take a little bit longer on their journey than others. I don't have to be like my grandpa, and that way I'm not like my grandpa. I'm not like either grandfather. And my children aren't like my grandparents in that way. And my dad wasn't like my grandparents in that way. And I praise God for that. Racism will not be part of the remnant church. Okay? It won't be here. Why? Because you read Genesis, and God created man and woman in his image. We all came from the hands of God. And God does not, he's not partial. He doesn't have favorites when it comes to uh, various races. I read a story this week about um, Alexander Twilight. You heard of Alexander Twilight? I had never heard that story before. USA Today put it out this week for Black History Month. Never read it or heard a story before. He was the first African American to earn a bachelor's degree. First one. I thought, well, how did that happen? It happened up in Vermont. He went to the Vermont Middlebury College. This is at a time where all the students at the college were white, except for him, the only one. Well, they said he made it through because he was a lighter-skinned African. And so they couldn't totally tell his mom was white, his dad had been African, and so he was light-skinned. And uh, on his uh, records, where they uh, did a census, she just put all of her family was Caucasian. And so he went through school all the way through, got his bachelor's degree, and became the first black pastor of an all-white church. And there he was who preached to all of them. You know what? No one, they loved the guy. He became the principal of one of the big schools there. And when he retired, they said, you've got to come back. We can't even run this school, but you did a great job running it. So he came back and ran the school again because he was a great leader. It wasn't until years later that... Uh, they started putting out a story and saying, man, this is the first African-American that got his bachelor's degree. I said, well, how was he able to do this? And they said, because no one noticed his skin color. Being colorblind, not noticing people. And, and someone said today when I shared it at Whitwell, well, why didn't he stand up for everybody else? Maybe he was scared. I don't know his reason. Because really, at that point in time, it doesn't matter if you were lighter skinned or darker skinned, every black person should have the same opportunity that Twilight had. Every single one should have that opportunity because it, it's not the color of your skin that, that should keep you from succeeding in life or getting an education. He did great things. He had achieved a lot of the people in Vermont, and they were calling them back, and it wasn't based on the color of his skin. I thought, why couldn't they be colorblind with everybody? And why do we still have those issues today, and even in the church? It might be out in the world, but it should not be here. On August 28, 1963, Martin Luther King Jr. at the Lincoln Memorial said, I have a dream that my four children will one day live in a nation where they'll not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. One day he'll see that dream fulfilled. Probably not, well, he's, he's resting in Jesus now. It wouldn't have happened here in this earth, I don't believe, because of sin. It keeps us from being able to do that. But those who are filled with the Holy Spirit will live this out. And one day in heaven, he'll see that. We will judge one another by the content of our characters, not the color of our skin. I remember going to Nickajack Lake last year, 
And uh, I believe it was around 4th of July near that time. And there were a lot of people picnicking. And uh, we were just walking around the lake. And there were a bunch of black families that were having a picnic together. And their children were playing on the playground. My little daughter, Noelle, was watching the kids play as we walked by. And she said, Daddy, can I please go play with my friends? We'd never met them before. We didn't know them from Adam. She didn't mention color. She didn't mention race. She just said, Daddy, can I go play with my friends? And I said, yes, Noel. Let's go up and play with your friends. And her parents came out, and we had conversations like friends. They even invited us if we wanted to stay and eat. We were friends. That is a taste of heaven. And Jesus says, unless we can become converted like little children, we're not going to be there. I say, Daddy. And when we left, she got tears in her eyes and said, Daddy, please don't take me away from my friends. I want to keep playing with them. I said, oh, Noel, but we've got to get back home. We might see our friends again sometime. The sad reality is prejudice doesn't just happen when it comes to race. It happens when it comes to education. I won't even mention the church I was at, but uh, the first church I pastored was a Caribbean church. And uh, I'll tell you what, you don't want to tell someone... Hi, I guess you're from Jamaica, because they're from all kinds of islands, and it doesn't matter. You say Jamaica, and they're from another island. They will eat you alive. They're like, we're not from Jamaica. Don't. <laughs> they're very proud of their islands. But I know some of them didn't have the education that other ones had, and they were looked down upon. And I, I heard some of the elders, even the pastor, saying, well, you know, those guys, they didn't take the time to learn how to speak English correctly. But I'll tell you what, some of the ones who didn't speak English as well were the best workers in the church even though they were looked down upon because they didn't have the same education or couldn't speak English as well. I said, you know what? There's prejudice based on how someone speaks English or, or on their education. There was prejudice based on jobs that people had. And they were looked down on because their jobs were inferior. There was prejudice on income and prejudice on position and prejudice on color. And sadly enough, there's some people who are prejudiced based on the religion. And I've had some people, even my kids I've taught, it's like, I don't know if I want to be Adventist because you the Adventists think they're so proud. They think that, that they are better than every other religion. I said, you know what? There's some truth to that. There are some Adventists who walk around just like the Jews, and the Jews thought, we are so much better than, than the Samaritans. We're so much better than Gentiles. Paul never said that. He didn't say, I boast in my Judaism, although he could have. And he says, he says here's all the stuff I can claim about me being a Jew. He said, if I'm going to boast, it's going to be about Jesus and him crucified. God didn't raise up the Adventist church so we could boast about ourselves. He raised up the Adventist church so we could uplift Jesus, share about Jesus' soon return, share about what it means to really love Jesus with all of our hearts and love our brothers and neighbors and our, ourselves. It's not to walk around like, we're better than the Catholics, we're better than the Lutherans, we're better than everybody. That's prejudice. And it keeps us from being able to spread the everlasting gospel. I said, how sad that it's crept in even to our denominational name. There'll be no prejudice in heaven. There'll be no prejudice amongst the remnant of Jesus. We won't be proud of our denomination or proud of our education or proud of um, our race. It's one thing I, I don't even watch the Olympics anymore because there's so much pride that goes on there. Our country is better than your country. I'll tell you what, I'm a citizen of heaven. And we're all we're all invited to be there. We're all invited to be there. And truly, prejudice comes from pride. Wanting to be better than somebody else. And that's what brought Satan to his downfall. Pride and fear is what brings on prejudice. I don't want to have pride in my life. And perfect love casts out all fear. Final thing, if we're really going to be lovers, Jesus says in John 21 this to Peter. John chapter 21, starting in verse 15. John 21 and verse 15. They had just eaten breakfast, Jesus and his disciples, for the last time. It says in John 21, 15, So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. And he said, Feed my lambs. Jesus said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? 
And he said to him, Lush, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Tend my sheep. Jesus said to him, third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. We can't really love Jesus unless we're sharing our faith. I'll tell you that today. We're keeping the good news, we're keeping the gospel to ourselves. We don't really love Jesus. And we know that Jesus has sheep that aren't of this fold. He has sheep uh, all over the place. And that's why we can't be prideful. He says if we love him, we're going to feed his sheep. Um, we're not trying to make cookie-cutter Adventists. Let's just put it that way. We're bringing people to Jesus, to fall in love with Jesus. We don't want to make legalistic lawyers. We want people to fall in love with Jesus and say, yeah, we keep the Sabbath because we love Jesus. So do we really love Jesus? Are we feeding his sheep? That was the last great commission, wasn't it? The disciples going to all the world, to all nations, and make disciples? What kind of disciples am I making, lawyers or lovers? I hope I'm not making a jailhouse lawyer like I was. There was a, a young man named Samuel Morris. Have you ever read his story before? Some of you probably have. Uh, Elder Chuck Cleveland told me to read the book. I didn't have time to read the book, but I read part of the story they had online. He was a prince. As a young boy, he was called Prince Kabu. He was from the Kru tribe in Liberia. And even amongst the African tribes, there was prejudice one tribe against another. And one day a neighboring tribe warred against his tribe and they captured this little prince and took him captive and they told his dad, if you want your son back, you've got to pay ransom money every single month. And every month the dad would come and pay the ransom money and the other tribe said, too bad, not enough, we're keeping your son. And month after month the dad would try to come and pay to get his son back, so, too bad, not enough, we're keeping your son. They kept this young boy ransom, made him do a, a lot of work and things for their tribe, and they beat the boy uh, mercilessly. And one day when he was about to get his beating, a light came down from heaven, and uh, his ropes fell off his arms where he was tied up, and he was told to run free. He said, Kabu, I've heard your cries. You are free. And he ran. He ran through the woods, and he ran all the way to a, uh, a mission there in Africa. No, it wasn't an Adventist mission. It was a mission that taught about Jesus. In Kabu's first week in church, he heard a story about Apostle Paul and how Apostle Paul saw Jesus. I mean, Apostle Paul was a worker for the church, was he not? He was a great Jew, a great lawyer, a great legalist. He knew the law, and he was persecuting people for not keeping it, at least the way he thought it should be kept. And Apostle Paul saw the light and was converted and came to his heavenly father. Kabu said, that's my story. I saw the light. I was set free. I found my heavenly father. I want to be like Apostle Paul. I want to go back, and I want to convert the world. He had a lot to learn, and so he stayed there and learned from the, the teachers there at the little mission. He said, I want to learn more, though. I want to be a missionary like you, and I want to go back. And his whole hope was to convert his tribe and to convert the tribe that persecuted him. He's like, I want them to find the same Jesus that I found so they can love like I love. It's so that one day we can all be in heaven together, this promise. And so this young man learned a little bit of the gospel in the village and said, I've got to go to America to the school where you learned. And so he waited weeks to get on this ship. When he got in this ship and finally got on, he had no money. They let him on and they gave him all the worst jobs on the ship. And even the ship there at times, they locked that boy up and they beat that boy. And a lot of times he'd get whipped because he'd talk about his father. And he'd sing to his heavenly father. And all the conversations with men would get so angry. Why do you keep talking about your father? It's like, because my father's so good. <laughs> my heavenly father set me free. My heavenly father gives me joy. And all these conversations were all about his father. And by the time they got to America, most of that ship had been converted to Jesus. Why? He didn't know the doctrines. It's because he talked about his relationship with his father. And how much he loved his father and how much his heavenly father loved him. And he gets to America and finds this man named uh, Dr. Merritt who ran the this, this school. And 
he didn't have time for the kids to just go into the school. I got some meetings to go to. When he comes back, he sees this little African boy praying with all these students and leading them in a prayer service. And he's converting the school. Because even though they were going to this Christian college, they weren't converted. They knew doctrine, but they didn't love Jesus. And they didn't love others. And they didn't even love necessarily sharing faith. It's amazing the people he led to Jesus while he was there at that school for about a year and a half before he passed away. In fact, when there was ever a prayer meeting, they always asked Samuel Morris, which was the new name he gave himself, they had always asked Samuel to go and do the talks. Hey, we have a prayer meeting. We have a Bible study. Samuel, you go and do it because everyone wanted to hear him talk. Why? Because he loved Jesus and they knew it. They loved Jesus and it just came out of him. And when he passed away due to getting a cold which turned into pneumonia one winter, they said, Kabu wanted to go back and win his tribe to Jesus. We're going to go and we're going to do that. He had converted a school that started now instead of just being a school for, you know, Christians in America, we want to become a mission school not just a Christian school. And they became a missionary school and started sending all their students to other countries to win people to Jesus. What can God do to somebody or through somebody who's a lover, lover, not a lawyer? He can do anything. If we can learn to love Jesus with all of our hearts and soul and all of our minds and love our neighbors as ourselves, there's no more powerful weapon than that. Today, if you want to be a lover, Jesus says, hey, keep my commandments because they're all based on love. If you want to be a lover, love one another. Start right here in your own church. And then love everybody out there. And don't let anything keep you from loving them. Nothing. And then finally, if you're really going to love me, you've got to share your faith with somebody. Start with your neighbor. Start with people next to you that you don't talk to because you're too scared to. You've got to talk about Jesus in order to share Jesus. It would be sad if you get to heaven one day and you find out your neighbor missed out and you never talked to that neighbor. You get to heaven, you find out that somebody you work with at work didn't make it, and you never talked to them about Jesus? Oh, if you love Jesus, how can you not share Jesus? I pray today that as a church family that we can say, hey, why do we go to Jasper Church? Because we're lovers. Because we love Jesus, and it's a church that loves Jesus, which means that we keep his commandments. And his commandments aren't burdensome. We're a church that loves one another. Even when we have disagreements, we work it out, and we don't let strife grow until we hate one another. And we reconcile because we love each other. And finally, go to this church is because we love our community, and we want to share Jesus with everyone in our community, and not just here, but abroad. Our final song today is, My Jesus, I Love Thee. I know thou art mine. For thee, all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. Let's be lovers this Sabbath. Hymn number 321. My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine, for thee all the follies of sin I resign, my gracious Redeemer, my Savior. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. I love thee because thou hast first loved me and purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. I love thee for wearing the thorns on thy brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, 
just is now. All of the in life I will love the in death and praise thee as long as thou lendest me breath and sing when the death do lies cold on my brow if ever I love thee my Jesus tis now in mansions of glory and endless delight I'll ever adore thee in heaven so bright I'll sing with the dead who lies down on my brow if ever I love thee my Jesus tis now let us pray Father in heaven, we are so thankful that you loved our church so much, that you gave your only begotten son. So thankful that you loved us individually, that you loved me so much, that you gave your only begotten son. Lord, we want to love others like you love us. We want to love you with all of our hearts and souls and all of our strength. So Lord, it's my prayer that if someone comes this week and asks us, hey, what's the greatest commandment? We won't say number four. We'll say the first and great commandment is to love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our strength. The second is like it, to love each other, to love our neighbors and our enemies like we love ourselves. Because on these two laws rest all the laws and all the prophets. Lord, it's my prayer that if someone asks us, hey, why are you a Christian? I mean, why do you go to Jasper Church? Why are you a Christian? We'll say, because we love God. Because we love each other. And we love him because he first loved us. Lord, it's my prayer that this week that we'll be lovers and not lawyers. And that's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, you might be seated and an usher will usher you out.